You're watching The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee. We got a special guest in the building, the homie, uh, Mr. Fab, who's here with his first book, yeah. Dope Era. The book by my man, Mr. Fab. <laughs> I yes, like sir. that. I like the uh, the acronym. During oppression, people evolve. Everyone rises above. Yeah. What's, what made you want to write this book? I feel like a lot of stuff, especially right now in my city, man, is where I'm at. I went from being a young dude to the the old head with, with the influence that people look up to. Um, and a lot of kids saw some of the things that I've done. Like, it kind of made it possible for them to do it as well. They didn't see no major labels. They didn't see no major budget. They just seen sheer grinding. They see me selling shirts out the trunk of the car. They see me going through the adversity that I've gone through in my music career and everything else. And I wanted to be able to put that in a position for them to read it to see, man, look, this is possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about a, like an autobiography, but it's more so about these are the roads that one can take to get to, you know, where it is that, that they want to go. Um, some, some motivation, some some aspiration and just some influence, man, utilizing that, like, man, stay in focus, man. Here goes some game for y'all. I feel like the big homie has been, they've, social media and other things like that have just totally demolished the big homie. This is people's big homie right yeah. here. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So your, like, your phone is like, there's no more influence, there's no more, yo, chill, my neck. Like, yo, do this, do this, little homie, let me show you how to do this. So it's just about me just being the big homie, man, being the big homie that I had than even the ones that I wish I had. Mm -hmm in times that could have prevented me from doing certain stuff. So that's all it is. It's just a motivation. And hopefully it doesn't just not be left for just the kids. It's some, some of my peers, my colleagues, and some of my older folks, too, to, to gain some motivation from it as well. Yeah, yeah, you start off the book talking about your own experiences that have led you to be able to give knowledge to the younger generation. And just talking about your mom, your dad, everything that happened with them. One thing that I can appreciate you talking about, though, a lot of it has to do with these kids are so influenced by social media. They see people with nice things. People want to be scammers. They want to obtain all these material goods. And you talk about that also and how foolish that is. Like I say, social media has made us socially awkward. Yes. It's easy for a person to get caught up in the flex, especially if you don't have the comprehension to decipher what's real and what's not. A person can go on, on just because you have influence, a person can go up with $100,000 that's fake and People, will, by the end of the day, be like, bro, bro, had a hundred bands on him, mm -hmm. man, bro, I'm trying to get on, huh? whatever he doing. So then they'll start following a fake guideline to get this money. And then they, they selling themselves short. So it's no more morality, it's no more integrity, it's no more, what are you standing on? Yes. What principles? So I think the principles of morality have been destroyed due to the social awkwardness that social media creates. That's why I like, uh, and I know this may sound crazy, I like when certain things happen to people online. Meaning that when I see people flashing guns and flashing dope and committing crimes and recording them, when they actually get arrested, I'd be happy because it makes me realize like things have not changed in the street regardless of how much these people think things change. Like it's certain rules you have to abide by. Right. No talking on the phone is something that we always follow through. Don't broadcast your business. Since they're doing that, they're going to jail for it. I like it. It's you know, I don't wish jail on nobody, but I see what you're saying yeah. though. Like I, I feel they like they need to know its consequences. I was just gonna say, I feel like they're nowadays people don't do they don't realize that there are consequences for their actions. Yes. And then what's even worse than that is a person to be quick to say, oh, man, you told on me or they told on me. And it's like, wait a minute, bro. You told on yourself. Self snitching. Or you, you put yourself <laughs> in a position to you, 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 you risk involving somebody that had nothing to do with your BS. And you put them involved in that. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? I think the c civilians and criminals must. It's, it's a different line. You can't do something to a civilian that don't have nothing to do with nothing that you got with your criminal mind state and then say that they told on you. Yes. Like so the consequences and things like that, most definitely, I feel like people need to grasp back in reality. And then the folks that really know, I feel like you owe if you know. Like, if you know the difference and if you know the consequences and you know the repercussions for some of the things that you're doing mm -hmm. and you're still putting that out there, like you say, something needs to happen to you as well. Yes. You got to learn from your mistakes. For sure, you for sure. You talked about that with your mom, too, early on, how you had the $100 bill. Man. And she stole the money. That was the craziest thing ever. He, like, I, I, it was so funny as I remember that day like yesterday, you know what I mean? And, and I remember it... Um, Staying on Bush Ride, it's just like an infamous city, an in, uh, infamous area in my in my hood, and we stayed on the top of Bush Ride, man. And my mom, her friend, he was like a preacher, 
and he had gave me some money, man. He knew what was going on, and I put the money in my bank, and I was just like, yo, man, I'm finna go do hella stuff tomorrow, man, when I, when I wake up. And my mom, when I woke up, man, the money was gone. I went in the room, and my mom was on the edge of the bed doing her dauphine pace, and it, it, dev- it killed me. Like the back and forth, of pay, it, it, I'm talking about it destroyed me because I was just like, it wasn't even so much about the money at this point no more. It was the fact that, man, you went and you took my money and bought crack with it. Right, from your own son. Like you stole from your own son. Like this addiction is that serious? And in the dope era that we grew up in, man, and anybody that, that grew up in these times, they could relate to that. Crack made people do some things that was like vicious. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um. But that was the last day that I had ever seen my mom high. Mm. Right. So that experience really did make her learn her lesson. Man, it changed it changed the whole trajectory of which my life went. So after what, she that. got clean after that? She got clean after that, man. She got clean. She uh dropped me off in my grandmother's house about two, three months later. Like, you know what I'm saying? Came back and she was she was man, she was right, man. She was she was So right. that was like rock bottom for her, stealing from her yeah, son. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. she, she saw how bad it hurt me. You know what I mean? And my mom, man, you know, rest in peace to my mom, but I felt like my mom was the greatest human on earth. You know, and everyone should feel this way about their parents, about their mothers. Unfortunately, some people don't. But our relationship was not just mother and son. That was like my sister, my best friend, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So at an early age, our bond was, I'm my mama's only child. So our bond at that time was so shifty because she realized that she put something before our bond. And she made a vow that she would never do that again. And she never did that again for the rest of her life until she passed. She never put nothing before me. That's like, great. That story could have went in either way. For it could have went the other way also. Could have been bad. Like, it could have been child protective services. It could have yeah. been, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it could have went worse worse than what it was. But I'm glad that she caught herself and, 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 man, she bounced back, man. And like I say, man, that was my superwoman, man. That woman, even to her last day on this earth, she didn't want to let me down. Like, our last conversation went something like, she got cancer. The cancer's eating her apart. It's crazy. I ain't want to see it like that no more. And I, I grabbed her. Ma, you can go. Like, I'm good. Like, you know what I'm saying? I got my baby. I'm going to take care of my daughter. I'm good. I'm handling my responsibilities. Ma, you could go. And I swear to God, I walked in the kitchen, and I came back, and she passed. Like, she was waiting for that confirmation, man. You know, and I ain't, like I said, I ain't trying to kill the moment or nothing, but that was just how... That's how strong she was for me. She ain't, she ain't had no more fighting than she was fighting mm-hmm. just so she wouldn't let me down. Well, who 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 helped raise you? Because your, your mom passed and then your father. Now, this was early. Like my, early. Mom, okay, my mom okay. just passed like like eight years ago, nine years ago. But I'm saying even then she was she was on dope when you were younger, right? So she wasn't really involved. She, involved. she, she kicked it, though. She, she so, when she it. got clean, when mm-hmm. she got clean, um, my dad died when I was like 12. My dad had AIDS. My dad died. Um, I was like 12. My grandmother was, you know, an iron woman. I called my grandmother mother before I called my own mom mom. Right. You know, but it's no different. It's a typical story that everybody grows up. I won't say everybody to generalize it, but the majority of my friends are people who grew up at their granny's house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And granny raised them because all of our parents was on drugs. It was mm-hmm. That was the dope era. This mm-hmm. was the times. Um, you didn't what, know much about HIV, though. At the hell time. no. Just Easy E and Magic Hell Jackson. no. That was it. Like, 92, 93, nobody knew what... We we was kids. I was eleven years old. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Nobody when magic or nothing. Ninety three, ninety four, ninety four, ninety four. Yeah, yeah like, 90, like ninety two. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was just like nobody, especially in the black community, we didn't know what that was. We nah. thought it was, you know, what I'm saying something that came from other stuff, and we was like, yo. The truth to the matter is, we thought it was something that gay people. Had. I'm gonna let you that's say the, it. that's the truth though. But but we, we've all evolved from that. Well, since yeah, then. we have. But back then, that's what everybody. That's thought. what it was. Yes. Like you know, what I'm saying we thought it was a gay. You know, saying something yes. like you say, and, and I, ain't, I ain't know nothing about. It. I'm like AIDS. Like my dad, my dad was gay. Like what's going exactly. on? Exactly. I remember when Magic announced, people was like, "Magic gay." Like that's because that's especially where I was from. That's what everybody thought. It was crazy. What man, did the but, other kids have to say about that? Being that everyone thought that. Um, I don't even think like it was that. Back then, it wasn't no, you know, you you ain't know. So it wasn't, everybody ain't know your business back right. then. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So people just like, your dad died. Okay, no, nothing like, oh, your dad died from AIDS. Or mm-hmm. you got AIDS, your daddy had AIDS. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, things like that. I was never like the butt of people jokes. I was never the butt of people jokes, not at all. Um, so what'd you, how'd you get over that? Like, 
Or did you get over it? Now you, it's, it's things that psychologically, man, it seems we, we repress certain things growing up, and it seems as if, like I was seeing you say some things, man, before, like you keep things in so long that it do do things to your psyche. Yeah, it do, yeah, it yeah. does. And then when they finally come out, people be looking at you like, yo, what happened? Yeah, exactly. You, like, what? Are you crazy? So, Cause I, all this stuff we think was normal, it ain't normal. That's just not normal, We just normalized bro. it. Yeah. We got, the things that we... And in our hoods and our things like that shit don't be normal. Like somebody getting shot and they be like, "Oh, blood just got shot." Like, "Oh, damn, he good?" Yeah. Yo, what you doing? Or like, go, like go to Chick Fil A. Like it be <laughs> like it's crazy. Like we normalize some of the the biggest atrocities that the world have seen. Mm -hmm. It's 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 nothing to us. We was eating the other day watching the gram. Somebody get his head blown off. He's like, "Damn, that nigga got smoked." And yeah, let me pass that ketchup. But it's just like you know what I'm saying. But. I began to write. That's when mm -hmm. I started writing. When my father died, I began to write because, like I said, I was my mother's only child. My mom was a recovering drug addict at the time, and I really felt like I couldn't vent to anyone else but my notebook. So I began to establish a great relationship with my notebook. Like on some real, the personification of my notebook became my, it was my best friend. And I wrote everything. I wrote my whole life in my journals and, and, and my notebooks, and I shared the poetry, soliloquies, haikus, and more and so, just writing, creative writing, just to escape. I created this fa this fairy tale world, and I lived in it. And the beauty of that is my imagination became much further and more realer than my reality. Mm. So my life became like a fairy tale, and I live in that still to this day. Mm -hmm. My imagination is much bigger than the reality that I go through, and that's what keeps me just doing what I'm doing. Humble, focused, hungry. Um, and, and, and driven. Did you do any research on AIDS once once you find out that's what your father passed from? Um, most definitely because I wanted to explore it a little bit more and, yeah, yeah, and really yeah. learn about it. Um, the intricacies of what what happened. Um, because you said you asked the question, was my father gay? Yeah, like you so who me? schooled you? Be like, nah. That's now my way. mom, my mom told me about you know what was going on, and then I wasn't a lame. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I grew up in these houses. I grew up in in, in, in homes where a lot of things was. Something that we shouldn't have been exposed to as a child. Right. I grew up in these homes, like, you know what I mean? You you watching your dad on Heron, you know, your mom in the other room, and my brother in and out of jail. And, like, you know what I'm saying? I, I was watching all kind of stuff as a child. So I knew my dad was a, a heroin addict and was using needles and things like that, you know, several times. Or pass me that belt, mm. go in your room. You know, you go in the granny house and all the spoons is burnt up. Mm -hmm. You're like, what the hell is up with the right. spoons? So... I wasn't a lame, you know what I'm saying? I knew what was going on. So, you know, the needles, passing needles and dirty needles. And so I'll be, you know, later educated myself on it. But at 11 years old, 12 years old, you're not trying to really uh, wake up to the reality that your dad's a drug addict and he died from his drug addiction. All right. So, you know, but but that's what it was, man. As I get older, it is what it is. Um, Did your circumstances ever make you angry? Were you ever filled with, like, rage? Most definitely. Most definitely you become, because you're looking for somebody to blame. Mm-hmm. Um, so many things become taken from us when we grow up, man, especially in, in the situation we grow up in. You know, you lose your dad early, then your mom in these streets, and you're trying to figure out, like, damn, God, what's up, my nigga? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, why you why you giving this a cold hand you want to mm -hmm. deal with, nigga? Mm -hmm. So you try to look for ways. That's why you start young. You start young and thugging. You start venting. You start rebelling against the powers that be. Um, luckily enough, my mother was so so much of a player she always just, you know, she she showed she she would sit me down and give me the game, mm. like this is what it is. When once she got her life together, like my mom went from super boss Benzes and Cornices and everything to going through the drug stuff to bouncing back on some player shit. So when she finally bounced back in my teens, my mom was like, everybody thought we was balling. Mm -hmm. Everybody be like, bro, y'all, you the spoiled kid, like you. You got all the, you got everything. Like you spoiled. You don't she know nothing about struggle. She, but she she was like, I'd rather spend my last on my son than give it to the dope man. Mm. So she went out her way to spoil me, man. I mean, I'm talking about three, four jobs. I ain't my teenage years was great. I ain't missed nothing. Like, you know what I'm saying? Any pair of Jordans, Nintendos. any everything. <laughs> like my house was the the house house. Like <laughs> Bro, let's go to Stan's house, bro. Stan's good. I open house. Ma, she used to be like, bring the girls over here. I don't want you going to no girl house. because you got all the snacks. Everything, bro. The cabinet was... <laughs> and we had... Remember, the North Oakland Bakery was right there. We right by the North Oakland Bakery. So Hostess was right. We got everything that you could think of, man. Like, you know what I mean? We was like the only house that had cable that wasn't stolen. <laughs> like, for real. Like, we had all the video. It was lit, man. You know what I'm saying? But, you know... Um, so all of that kind of kept you out of the streets and kept and you that's from what doing I was saying. drugs and everything. That's what I was saying. That kept me, well, 
you know, we we was you know smoking and, and doing what we did as a youngster. My my house was the trap house, like you know what I'm saying. We was hustling. My mom was a hustler. No matter what, when she left again, she still was hustling. Mm -hmm. Like she, this lady, she sold prescription pills, we everything all out the same house. I mean, it's no statute of limitations. It's a statute of limitation on that. <laughs> she gone now, wherever she may be resting. But you know, my mom was a hustler, so my house was always the the trap house. So we always had weed. Everybody was like, "Yo, mom, your mom's got some weed." Yeah, yeah, we good, we good, we good. It never got dangerous though. People knowing that your house was the house that maybe somebody tried to run up in it. I mean, in the hood, everything is it's always danger. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's why, like, like, like YG album, man. You gotta stay dangerous, cause at the end of the day, careful will get you hurt. So we always, like, my, I'm telling you, my mom was really a gangster. So it was like. It was always, she always had a strap. It was always like, you know what I'm saying? It was always a, a sense of anxiety hanging over everybody's head. Come on, man, we moving, That man. paranoia, like you just, that's what keeps you on point, sadly. You stay on your, you stay on your toes, but it was the game. And I'm so thankful that she gave me the, like, like she, we would go to the strip club. I'd be 13, 14 years old, like 14 years old. And she ran a strip club downtown. It was called, um... The first stop, and all the ball players would be there from like Latrell Sprewell, Joe Smith, Daniel Marshall. This at the time when the Warriors was like trash, but <laughs> they were all. This must have been before Run TMC. Wait, wait, it's like right after Run TMC, after, like okay. the rebuilding of the Warriors. Got you. And but all of them would be at her club on Mondays, and I would be down there, and she would just sit me at the edge of the bar and just give me descriptive of of who everybody is. Like this is the trick. This is the John. This is the player. This is the gangster. This is the shyster. This is the con artist. Like, and she would just sit down and we would people watch. And she would tell me, this woman, she paying for tuition. This woman, she scheming. She trying to get a baby daddy. So I've learned how to analyze situations just based off people observations. It's like a movie. Man, I'm telling you, it's a real life movie, man. But I'm thankful for that because that game and that observation skills that she gave me has been embedded in my mind for so long that I helped. My daughter even with things nowadays where we sit up and we just go people watch and just give her some game. Mm -hmm. So you can't be naive. So I never grew up being naive. So that game has always helped me be where I am today. Now, being that, that your father passed uh, when you were 12, did your mother serve as the father figure role or was there another man in your life who came in and served as that role? My mom did the best she could as a dual parent, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. as, as being a mom and dad. But um, she later married a guy, um, which led to my, me and my stepdad, which... I have nothing but love and respect for him because for the first time in my life, I saw a man who didn't smoke, didn't drink, um, got up and went to work every day mm -hmm. um, and put it all on the line. Take me in like I was one of his own. Like, you know what I mean? I had a, He had a son and a daughter, but he took me in like I was one. He taught me how to drive, gave me certain morals and things like this as a kid, just like, this is, you know, this is this is the different side. My mom only messed with gangsters and players, so this was mm -hmm. the first time that she had like a dude that had something. Somebody, somebody they would call a square. What they would call a square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. he was an old school gangster just reforming his life. True, true, true. You know what I'm saying? True, true. Ones. Good. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So, but he was just a cool, yes. you know, the subtle storm. But this was the first time I ever seen somebody getting up, going to work for it the honest way. Mm. You know what I mean? Every day going to work, not missing a day at work, and. My stepdad, man, was a hero to me because he was a real man. You know what I mean? He he did. And, and, and until this day, man, he's still a real real man. He just recently had a stroke, man, which is, that's why I'm, it's kind of like a, pushing up some different emotion right now. But he just had a stroke. Um, that's kind of like got him got him confined to a chair or whatever. But, um, man, Rob, man, I, I, I love you so much, man. My stepdad was really really a good dude, man. He, he really is a good dude, so I love that dude. It's interesting. You said In the book, you said your, your your father shaped your character, but it sounds like your stepfather shaped your character, too. My dad gave me the Hey Baby, and what I mean by Hey Baby is just, dude, like, this dude was fly, man. Like, my dad looked like he was straight out of movie. Like, I'm talking about, even, even on drugs, this dude still looked like Prince from Superfly. Like, he was gold. <laughs> like, he was just, you know, his, his nails stayed, you feel me? Manicured up, his smile, his face always lined up. He always had some Gucci, some, you know what I'm saying, salt. He was just, he had that drip, man. He was sauce. Like, you know what I'm saying? And no matter what his situation was, he was always charismatic about it. He was always up. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I remember just something, just a, a day where he'll pop up at my school and people would be like, man, your dad outside. 
He walk over there, you know what I'm saying, probably got some gators on or something, something clean. He always smelled hella good, like he robbed Macy's or something. <laughs> but the, the, the play always smelled hella good. And um, he be like, hey, man, how you feeling, baby? Your mama gave you some money this morning, man. Yeah. <laughs> he talked like a movie, like this how he talked. Like, you got to think this Oakland, California, so it's like pimps and players, and this was his lifestyle. He was really, this This was him. So he be like, huh, man, hey, man, your friends got some money? Hey, come here, man. Huh, get this to your friend, man. Y'all chill, man. Your mom gonna worry if I give you some money? Tell her you got it from me, man. Mm. Just whoop, whoop, whoop. Y'all have a good day. <laughs> hey, I love you, man. Give me a hug. And I see you. I see you, man. And that's just how it was. Like, I, I have times where I really don't remember a lot, but the times that I do remember, it was always smiling. It was always, you know, some game being shared. And it was just all, he was just, he was that dude, man. So that character, and and what's so crazy is I'm his identical twin. Like his friends even today be like, damn, he looked like Stan, man, that's crazy. And all his friends is like the old school players. Like they, I had a backpack giveaway um Sunday before I came here. And you do that every year though. Yeah, this is the fourteenth year that wow. we did it. Fourteen. The blessing. Yeah. So that that's you been getting money a long time. <laughs> I'm only on number four. You good though. <laughs> You're good. This is my fourth year. The the beauty of it though is we can do it. Yeah, yeah. You know true, I mean, and, true, and, and true. then we influencing people to do it. Some people do it one, two years and be like, oh yeah, all right, we gave back. But the consistency to be able to continue to keep doing it to realize that there is a need for it because certain people look for that. Absolutely. Like I'm not gonna lie, it's certain families that be like, Yo, Fab, y'all doing that backpack giveaway right. this year? Cool. Like this lady, this sister, this sister came up to me the other day. Up, up there, and she was like, she got, she gave me a card, and she was like, listen, I work at the Marriott. I want to be able to help you one day. And I was like, what you mean? She's like, I just got a job at the Marriott. Every year, my son is going to the eighth grade. Every year since he's been in the third grade, second grade, we've come, and y'all have saved us money that we don't have to spend on backpacks and clothes like that. And I just want to thank you. And if it's anything that I can do for you to repay you or help pay you back, because I was just like, Wow. I was humbled by it because I, you know what I'm saying? I I, I really, you know, I, we don't do it for that. Mm -hmm. I do it for the healing, not the headlines. Right. I don't care if the news come out. I don't care if nobody come out. That's not what we do it for. But the beauty of it is this woman felt the need to say she wanted to help back because for we saving her money. This shit is expensive nowadays. Yeah. I don't know. I, mean, I know New York can relate, but <laughs> Oakland is hella expensive. It sure is. Like they just they just put some stuff on the news a couple weeks ago and said if you make one hundred and seventeen thousand a year, you still you still can apply for a low income housing. Oakland might be more wow. expensive than New York. Really? I think I so. Think like you're still low income housing. You're still that's still low income, so you can still get Section Eight if you make over a hundred thousand a year. That's crazy. Because they were talking about how many people uh, have problems finding housing out there Man, at it, all, period. And you'll go downtown and you see all these rich people walking around, but then you see homeless people. It is retarded. Like, my business, we my store is right in the business bureau of downtown Oakland on Broadway. And the amount of homeless people and, and, and homeless encampments that there are, it's, it's sad. So when we look for, when we talk about these city council meetings, you know, I be playing the politics game serious. Mm -hmm. So we sitting in the city council meetings or we having these business bureau meetings and our whole thing is like, yo, all this money that this city is getting and yeah, all this money so that this city is have, we're not going to build nothing for this homeless people. I'm talking about the homeless people live on the blocks. Like, y'all, I seen the homeless people out here. We got homeless real encampments like on main streets. You know, they're not thinking about the poor and disenfranchised Bro, it's at crazy, all. bro. And- the but you can't not see them because it's, it's like a, it's a house. It's like it's like projects of you can't pretend it doesn't exist. Five buggies, the cover, the blanket, they're trying to got doors. It's like real like apartments on the on main streets. That's crazy. Like in L.A., you may have it on Skid Row or it may be hidden in the back alleys. And right here, it's on main streets, like real homeless encampments where it's just like that's a whole. Community right there. They don't even acknowledge it, bro. They don't. You even, walk right past it. Right go to a restaurant. It. Go shopping. Right past it's, it's it's, bro. It's crazy, bro. So, like, our main thing and our cry to the city is, Mayor, yeah. why don't we implement some uh, rent control? Why don't we make more affordable houses? What's up with all these abandoned buildings downtown that we can know and we can turn these into transition homes? How come we can't have any uh, mobile showers? Mobile portable restrooms for these people to sit over here. This is inhumane it for is. them to live like this and for us to sit back and look at the city and do nothing. 
for the people that have influence to do nothing, to say nothing. Silence sides with the suppressor. That's real. So if you're actually sitting up in silence and you're saying nothing, then you're just as guilty as the person that's oppressing these people. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's up to us to start doing certain things in our city, in our community, to make better developments in what's around us. Because that shit is sad. The homeless rate right now, and it's not just drug addicts. It's not just alcohol, like people that are alcoholics. These are people who really go to work every day, who live in these encampments. Like, I got a car, and I can't afford a house, so I live here right now. Some of them are veterans. Oh, yeah, yo, that's the worst. I, I can't stand it. That's why I hate when they get on Colin Kaepernick or whoever else and say, oh, you're kneeling, you're being unpatriotic. I watched yesterday this guy standing there, a veteran with a sign. I gave him $20. Every other car was just passing him by, passing him by. And I'm like, I bet you that's the same person that'll be complaining about somebody kneeling for the flag. That is the worst thing is these people go out and fight for this country. And they'll leave it all on the line. So many lives have been lost for this country. So for the average patriotic American who sits back and sees these veterans over there who have mental issues, yep. who have lost limbs and everything, yep. who when they come back, their VA and their GA checks, no, nothing is granted. They pay them bare minimum. They, they won't even be granted housing, and, and, and it's selective housing, subsidized housing, where they're sitting up stuck in shacks and everything. And then they want to say, well, this is great America. This is this is the good, good, good America. Look how y'all treating y'all own. Exactly. Look how y'all treating people that defended this country. So you got veterans. You got people who have mental issues. And I feel like mental health issues, especially in the black community, is not dealt with as it should be. Not at all. When we we, we talk about somebody who may be having some mental health issues and we'd be like, oh, blood, crazy. Where we call it from, we'd be like, yeah, that nigga catting. But at the end of the day, he really does have mental health issues. Yeah. And these are things and these are issues that need to be brought to the forefront of us addressing these things because... It's sad, man, to see what that does as it grows and the trajectory of the growth of mental health issues as it expounds and goes further. As a person gets older, it gets crazy. Think about what you're talking about. You think you're not dealing with no trauma? Come on. You think you don't got some form of PTSD? Sure. Anxiety issues? The sister that was murdered the other day, I don't know if y'all if y'all heard about it, but it's a sister named Nia Wilson. She was murdered by somebody on the public transportation yeah, on the yeah, bar. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And they're going to push that he had mental issues and they're going to go try to say that he wasn't uh, mentally functionable to sub substand trial and they're going to try to push that. And whether or not he was or had mental health issues, what he did, that's murder. Right. 100%. That's, that's murder. And who gives these evaluations to let this person back out on the streets? Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Who's sanctioning these things? Where where's the board of education or where where's like where is the health board that are saying okay yeah you could go back out to the streets if somebody is this bad where they're gonna murder and slit somebody's they throat the they streets. shouldn't be back on the street no they done Put like them so, in a straight jacket so it's like come on man like we just have to do a better job of galvanizing the people together that make a difference that can make a difference and we need to stop all just being focused on who got the money or. Who fucking who? Or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's even, stuff that could be changed. Even going back to Nia Wilson, like, didn't she, she had friends with her on the train, right? Her sister. Imagine her, two her, her sister traumatized That's for it. life. Oh, forever. Her forever. Family forever. forever. Like, her sister got stabbed. That's what I'm saying. One sister got stabbed, the other sister had to watch it. Then what I was so upset about, her name was Nia. What I was so upset about was, where are the brothers? Where are the men? Yeah. As black men. Yeah. We we not gonna protect our sisters. We not gonna protect our. That could have been your daughter. That could have been your sister. That could have been your. You know what I'm saying? Your your cousin. Y'all just gonna sit back and let this so somebody could just come up and slit a throat and then walk away. Nobody does nothing. Hurry up. So our sisters have felt like the black men have let them down. Hundred percent. So we got to get back to saying. What are we going to do to help better and strengthen the relationships of us as a people? Black man to black man, black sister to black, you feel me? Mm -hmm. As a people, instead of always talking down on somebody. Like I said something to a lady the other day. I was like, hello, how you doing? And she didn't say nothing to me. I said, well, don't say nothing when they make me a hashtag. Ooh. Don't say stop killing our Ooh. brothers when they turn us into a hashtag. Ooh. If you don't want to speak to me while I'm alive. Mm. A person will pour out alcohol when you die, but they won't let you hit their bottle while you're alive. Mm. We got to start focusing on prevention. 
And that's what our whole situation is about. The dope era, our creating change movement, our creating change movement is about implementing certain situations that help in the prevention, not the rehabilitation. Because by the time you have to be rehabilitated, it's already too late. Yeah, we, we always say pray for such and such after something nah, happens. Nah, man, let's do this. Let's focus and put more money, more time, more effort, more energy into prevention. Let's start helping these kids before it get too late. Let's start giving out these scholarships, these programs, these things for these children that can invest in them before they get into trouble. Prevention is much better than rehabilitation because by the time they get to the rehabilitating state, they're already psychologically damaged. Yeah, you, you're trying to fix the damage. And the damage yeah. sometimes is beyond our control because we don't know the effects of the damage that is taken. It's unrepairable. It's, that's, some should be un unrepairable. Yeah. And that's why I never understand why they take away funding from schools because that's where everything starts with kids in schools, after school programs, education. Just took away 500000 from Oakland Unified Schools. So they just they just took away five hundred thousand and they just removed certain sports programs from the majority of all the schools in Oakland, California, which lets me know that they don't care about the people. Most of the people predominantly that play sports right. are us. Mm -hmm. So what is that doing? That's push. I mean, I'm going to keep it real. If it wasn't for sports, I wouldn't have went to school. I was I had real no interest in school other than sports. I was just like, man, all right, football season, basketball season, other than that. Baseball season, I wasn't ever in school. <laughs> Period. I swear to God, if, my co if, if Rick could hear this right now, okay. my coach Rick, my baseball coach right now, he was so mad at me because every time around baseball season, I was never eligible. <laughs> it's like, bro, I'm not finna be sitting there. It's, it's hot. <laughs> I'm sitting in this boring-ass class. And I really don't want to. I'm not passing. I'm and, sorry. And you didn't know how much baseball players make, clearly. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> you wouldn't have been so bored. I tell my tell my cousin came home with a hundred million dollars, Jimmy Rollins. Damn! And he's just like, damn, Jim, you did that. They get that boy so much money, man. So, but yeah, but like you say, man, it's it's nah, it's, it's crazy. I, I agree with everything that you're saying. Um, that's why I've been so big on just like mental health lately, man. Because right. I feel like everything is mental. Like the, the 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 mindset you're at now, it took you age and experience to get there. Same thing with me. But if we can implement these kids early, oh, my God, we change the world. You get a chance to deal with them. Like, we do these talent shows. My uncle just put together a super Oakland Got Talent talent show, and everybody came out. And to see the support was so humbling. And what I want to tell people, to the parents out there, to the parents, to the siblings, to the aunties, uncles, grandmothers, and more, supporting your child, supporting their dreams, it's far more important than anything in life that you will do. That's your greatest investment. That is your greatest investment because the worst thing that can happen is a child that feels like they're by themselves in this world. You know my favorite thing to watch nowadays? Richard Williams talking to young Venus and Serena. I was we was watching that. Man. We was watching that this morning. Which one you watched? Well, he interrupted the reporter that was We we watched uh him training them in Compton and like going super hard. I saw that one. Yeah, and, and and somebody was saying something to him and he was like, These my babies. Yeah, the white dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah he's like, yeah, he's yeah, like these man. my babies. Don't tell me how to yeah. raise my babies. Venus and Serena playing each other today. Yeah, they played us this they they I think the first time they played each other was twenty one years ago, so that was dope. And this Venus was like she was like, I got cheated last time. It was two verse one because yeah. Venus was the only one that knew Serena mm -hmm. was pregnant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like, that is that is a great success success story. People say whatever they want to say about Joe Jackson. I don't care. Joe Jackson made nine celebrities. He might have fucked them up mentally. <laughs> he made this. Well. He did, But Joe made sure that his babies was hit. They all were successful. But you know what's so funny? None of them, they all say that didn't happen. They all say he was a good father. I, I'd like, say he was a good father. Yeah. But you know, success... And mental health doesn't always go hand in hand Facts. at all. Success can make you have mental health. Right. But that's why I like Venus and Serena, because they are just two great women, period. Like, right. regardless of the accomplishments on the tennis court, you can just tell that they're both mentally sound, they're stable, they're just good human beings, and that the father that's instilled structure. a lot of that in them. That's, that's structure. structure, man. Yeah. Like, growing up with structure is beautiful. That's why I say it's imperative that we support our children. I don't care what my whatever my daughter want to do. Her dreams change every other day. But I be supporting. She like, Daddy, I want to draw. Okay, we're going to Michael's. Let me get you every canvas you want to get. Okay, Daddy, I want to create uh, computer coding. Okay, we're going to get in black gore coding. Let me call my homegirls over here at this Afrotech stuff. Yeah. We're going to get you on this computer coding. Black girls code. Okay, Dad, I want to do this show. She, she's nine years old. She's been to 12 countries. 
She's been, uh, you know what I'm saying, Africa twice. She didn't, I'm, whatever you want to do, baby, I'm going to invest it all in you because at the end of the day, I could still remember how supportive my mother was for me. Drugs and all. I'm talking about after that little episode that we had, my mama did everything she could to let to say, you going to be something. Mm. You ain't going to be one of these nothing ass niggas. You going to be something. I was moving the other day and I found a dictionary that she bought me and she said, baby, I hope that this dictionary helps you uh, 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 develop into one of the greatest writers ever. Like, and at an early age, she was planting them seeds. She was like, huh, you going to be something. Right. That's why I credit everything to her. She She's accredited for everything because she didn't give up on me. Mm. Every basketball game, she was right there. Every concert and show, mm -hmm. she was right there, front row. Like, that's my baby. It was lit. She working the doors and everything. <laughs> so we got to support our children. Listen, uh, I want to talk about your 10 keys to being dope. Yes, sir. Let's run through a few of those. Uh, keeping a positive perspective. Very tough to do when you come from the environment that a lot of us come from. How in do you do that? In a very negative world that we live in, like you said. Yeah. Keeping a, you have to. I think I feel like mm -hmm. it's uh, super important that you must understand the power of positivity. In this realm that we live, I think words create worlds. And you can create a world by the way that you approach it. And so my approach to this is no matter the negative vibes, no matter the negative surroundings around me, I'm going to always keep my energy positive because nothing can be worse. Like I tell a person, I don't have bad days. And the reason being, because my worst day on earth, my mama died. Mm. There'll never be another day like that again. Mm. So I can't have a bad day. That was the bad, the baddest day I've ever had. Mm. Right. So anything else is, hey, I'll get through it. I'll get over it. Mm. And then you have to realize that every day may not be a good day, but you could get something good out of every day. You know what you say that I also believe in strongly, too, is that a lot of times people have really uh, awful things to say about you and they try to play you and diss you. But that's more of a reflection on them than it is on you. People's what they have to say about you that's negative more reflects on what they feel about themselves. Man, a nigga keep your name in everything but a prayer. <laughs> like, you feel me? Like, that's something that you you got issues, bro. Now, I don't have the issues. Right. Or if I do, I'm embracing them. I'm mm -hmm. embracing all my insecurities. Yeah, go go fix your own flaws. I'm going. Yeah. I'm going to turn my wounds into wisdom. Mm. So I don't care what nobody say about me. I already know what I need to work on. Uh -huh. But here go a mirror. <laughs> What you need to work on. Right Focus on that. I did a whole TED talk on why do people hate people they don't even know. Like people will say that they hate you, never met you, don't really know much about you, be upset when you're successful. And a lot of that is because they feel like they deserve certain things that they haven't achieved. A lot of that is them being disappointed in themselves. It's jealousy. It's them seeing you in a position that they feel like you don't deserve to be in, that they should be in. A lot of different things. That's crazy. That's like when real. you see people that hate gay people, but they really are suppressing their own gay feelings. Like we see this happen in politics all the time. A politician will go so hard. Oh, gay marriage shouldn't be legal. It's against what, everything in the Bible. You know, you see that in the church. And then it turns out they're the ones. Bishop Long. Mm -hmm. Any Long. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's, it's crazy. Like, I don't understand. Like, people like, oh, man, these niggas is faggots. Like, brother. What's wrong with you? You got something going on? Right. You got something to it make you feel like are you Like why do you care something? so much? Like why are you so yeah, passionate yeah, yeah, about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like you know what I'm saying now you're going to have to reveal something because <laughs> it's not it's, that comes from somewhere. What's yeah. wrong, you all right? Yeah. Nah, man, I'm just nah. I'm, uh Forget it, man. Just let them do what they do. Yeah, okay, because you don't want to have to reveal them demons. We know you ain't got touched on or something. Something happened to you, like he's, I say. And he's sitting there, his dick hard right yeah, now. Like, nigga, you crazy. Like, you feel me? Like, I don't, like you said, I don't, what's wrong with you? I don't have nothing. If that's what you want to do, do it. Long Why as do you I ain't, care? Don't long me. as you not pushing your agenda on me, I don't care what you do. I don't care who you like. That's your thing. What about reinventing the role models? It's uh, it's super important that when we grow up, we grew up looking up to. I know I did. I grew up looking to the dope dealers, to the pimps, to the players, even myself. I named my album "Son of a Pimp," and to me, I was proud that my daddy was a pimp. And the the changing moment of my life is when my daughter said, "Daddy, what's a pimp?" Mm. <laughs> and I said, "Damn." Um. A pimp is someone that makes profits off a woman. She was like, so he don't want to work for his own money? <laughs> and it, it blew my mind because 
until you have to answer a question like that, it doesn't make you you don't check the reality that you putting out there. Yeah, especially if you're giving her allowance and she's doing chores and she turns your daddy, are you pimping me? Yeah. <laughs> you paying me to work for you? Are you pimping me? So it's so the crazy thing about it is I would parade and be happy that my brother has life in jail. I would always be like, nigga, my brother in jail, nigga. Can't wait to get out. Free my brother. And I was happy about that. Yeah, we celebrate all the wrong things. Yeah. So what we celebrate, we celebrate the evils, the ills, the poisons. We celebrate all the things that lead to the destruction of us as a community. And we continue to cha- parade these things. And we must reinvent the role models. Somebody will get more love getting out of jail than they would graduating from college. Mm-hmm. So we have to change the narrative and reinvent the role models. Nothing is wrong with showing love to that dude who has a job. Nothing is wrong with showing love to that college guy, to that black business owner, to that sister that has her own her her own uh, hair products going on. To, you know what I'm saying? That may be the next CJ Madam Walker. This may be the next Oprah. We have to start reinventing the role models to give roses to those that deserve them, not those that is putting the negativity and the poison back into our communities. I want to go through like two more of these. Fathers over figures. You have to be a father. Money, money is not important when it comes to being a father. My daughter would say, Daddy, she made me realize that my presence was more important than any present that I could have ever bought her. Any present that I could bought, she don't care about that stuff. Yesterday I call her. Babe, I just bought you some stuff, some shoes. One, one. You want to see them? No, I'll wait. <laughs> and I was just like, I would have been like, yeah, 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 let me see yeah, them. Yeah, she yeah. don't care about that stuff. She's just like, that. I just want you to come home. So m- your presence mm-hmm. is more important than the presence that you can buy your children. Mm. And a lot of people that are successful, that have some, 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 some money or some fame, they try to buy their children's love. You can't buy your children's love because at the end of the day, they'll begin to praise and worship the material things more than they do what you represent. So let's stop trying to buy our children's love. Can I ask you what you think about child support? Because that's been an ongoing debate. I think that'll never stop. But, you know, women asking for more money for child support. 250000 <laughs> <laughs> What that baby need? <laughs> but I just read Blake Griffin, baby mama, get two fifty a month. I was like, what? for what? <laughs> What could a baby possibly get? Two fifty? That's crazy, and I feel like child support don't support the child, mm. especially when you have women out here that are using their bitterness to better themselves. But what about like housing? As far as making sure that your child's mother, if your child lives with the mom, is in a really nice home at least. Yeah, I mean, pay, take... help paying for all those things, making sure the kids are in private school, making sure they have nice clothes so they don't leave mom's house and go to dad's house, and it's drastically. Man, take care of your children at whatever cost. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? The beauty, my daughter, mom, never even child support's never even a question. Right, because but some men don't take care of things yeah, and, like they should. And that's what fact. we have to go back to. What we talked about earlier is we have to go back to being men. Mm-hmm taking care of our communities, taking care of our families, being the kings, being leading the way. Sometimes you have to leave the pack to lead the pack. We have to be able to set these examples to be the men in our house, in our homes, and take care of your children. I don't care. That's why I say being a father is more important than anything, any figurative thing that you can make, money, cause, fame, success. None of that is important to me. Being a father is more important to me than all of that. The final one is uh, giving roses. I mean, it's 10 of them, but I just want to run through those four. Giving roses. I got to tell you that I appreciate you. Right. I got to tell you that I appreciate you. And I have to share that with you while you're still able to smell those roses. Mm-hmm. I have to share that with you while you're able to say, man, I appreciate you back. Or I appreciate you appreciating me. Nowadays, a person will wait till you die to give you a compliment. More people will be at your funeral than your wedding because they'd rather see you dead than to see you standing up happy. I feel that way, too. Like People call it dick riding just because you're showing love. If I like somebody, I'm a fan. I appreciate dick them. Dick riding know. came from social media. You're right. Mm-hmm. Like, you feel me? Like, damn, my nigga, you on that nigga dick, bro. Damn. <laughs> Even with females, like, my nigga, get off that bitch dick. Like, you feel me? Like, that's where, where we from. We say shit like that, you yeah. feel me? But it'd be like, nah, bro. I'm not afraid. Perfect example. I see Mason, uh, South by Southwest. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie. I grew up a super extreme Mace fan, right? <laughs> it's him and Chubby. Him and yes. Chubby, baby. They in they in South by Southwest in Austin. I'm like, I see Chubb. Chubb like, Fab, what's up? I'm like, man, just chilling, man, fucking around, doing a one-two. He's like, all right. I see Mace. I'm like, Mace, I ain't want to fan out. But this, this is, I was at the house parties, Mace Stout. 
Hat over the eyebrows, big everything, shiny, <laughs> cyber tech. I was maced out, right? I'm going to keep it real. No bullshit. I tell him, I say, yo, my nigga, I really grew up off of you, cousin. Can I get a picture? He like, nah, man, nah, I ain't really taking no pictures. Wow. Who the hell may he think that. he is? I'm not tripping. I'm like, fair enough. All right, cool. But look at in my mind, I'm like, nigga, fuck Mace. <laughs> right? Right? But at the end of the day, hey, man, nigga didn't feel like taking a picture. It'd be like that some days. Right. But that's still not going to make me say I'm not a fan or yeah, yeah, that yeah, I won't yeah, still yeah. go listen to Harlem World. Wait, so is Mason your top five on Bad Boy? Of course. Okay. I on Bad Boy? Of course. Well, yeah, Charlamagne doesn't think he's in the top five. Nah, Harlem I'm, World? Not lyrically. Because you got to think, you got Big. I'm sorry, Mace. I brought this up You got then. Big, then you got Jada, Styles. Mace was talking Jada, shit. Styles, Sheik, Black Rob. You going to put Sheik over Mace? Yes. Sheik, that's my mans. I love Sheik. Yeah, but man. As far as what Mace was doing, like. Just... And I'm going to be honest with you, if you go back and revisit Harlem World, Harlem World is like, eh. That's some bullshit. That you're about right now. <laughs> Name the top four records of Harlem World. Why are you over there looking at me? Whack in hindsight. I like that song too. Um, it's a terrible record now. <laughs> bad boy, that bad, bad, bad. Oh, man. really? <laughs> <laughs> you won't see me in it unless it's TVs in it. And Mace was stunting in 98, wow. 97, 90. He was going hard. He said, like, You the type that get hit and don't even know where you hit at. Bleeding all crazy and don't know where you hit at. That nigga was saying some crazy shit, bro. I like niggas want to act. Niggas want to act. We that was act. hard. Niggas want to clap. That we was hard. clap. That just turned into a Mace conversation. I ain't going to lie. I'm like, sorry. But, but even after that, right. even remember, after being fronted on, just remember I was still a fan. I'm still a fan. Black Rob would have took a picture with you. Like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa. He I fuck with Black Rob. But you know, that just... You know just... what's crazy? This is just uh, yesterday... Someone on my block was telling me a, a story about how his cousin wanted to take a picture with Fab, and Fab was like, nah, I'm not, you know. Some niggas don't be in the mood curve, sometimes. Like, nah, I'm not really doing that right now. He said his cousin, I mean, fuck him. What's wrong with all the slow rapping rappers don't want to take pictures, <laughs> man? <laughs> What's up, man? But I understand that sometimes you take a picture, then everybody come over and start it wanting become, to take It becomes crazy. Like I say. That would have not happened to me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the nigga that's going to get heartbroken right. about it and be gone or dispree or be so emotionally disturbed that, nah. I'm a fan. I'll still give you your roses. Even here today, even after that, I'll still, nigga, you still was one of my favorites growing up. So we got to give roses, man. It's not dick riding, give, dick riding giving somebody their credit, man. Giving somebody, showing them that you appreciate them. It's nothing wrong with that. So to the new generation, a nigga be like, man, I don't want to take a picture with this nigga. Nigga, I ain't no groupie. Listen, bro. Get that out your mind right Let's now. Let's make dick riding a good thing. Let's turn that into a good term. <laughs> I don't like that Whoa. term. I don't like you saying Come it like on. that. That Who sounds like that's a segment for <laughs> <laughs> lip sync. We might lip dick service that me. segment, bring it back <laughs> one time. Nah. No. <laughs> you are crazy. <laughs> dick riding me. This thing is crazy. <laughs> but nah, man, tell somebody that you love. If you got love for them, tell them you love them, man. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes. You feel me? They don't got to be your buddy, buddy, best friend, nothing like that. If you've been inspired by someone, tell them that you're inspired. I don't love wait. you, G-Dub. No. <laughs> Special delivery. <laughs> I'm telling you. Hey, that nigga had bars. I'm telling you. No, no bullshit. That's what I'm saying. Like, yo, when I no, compare. No, g had bars. Listen, and Mace can rap. I'm not saying Mace is whack at all. All I'm saying is when you compare him to Black Rob, g Dep, the Locks. But you got to think Diggy. Mace was writing Oof. a lot of that shit, bro. What? Ma nah, I'm not saying he's writing g Dep shit. He was writing, like, all the shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, so give runs. Mace his roses, Charlamagne, and tell him you love him. You don't him. fuck with Mace? I give him a rose. One? <laughs> Not one a bouquet. Two. Not uh, a bouquet. Uh, I give one or two. I fuck with you, yeah. man. Harlem World was the shit. <laughs> that we played it at all the house parties. Um, But tell somebody today, man, that you appreciate them. Please, man. Yeah. And, and and it's not... It's not if a person doesn't respond to you the way that you would think that they should, that's on them. That's their insecurities. Right. That's whatever they going through. Don't let them project that on say. you. Mm -hmm. You stay cool, man. I'm going to stay giving a nigga roses even if he don't accept them. That's well, real. we appreciate you, Mr. Fab. For Thank you so you much. I appreciate y'all. Go get his book, Dope Era. You feel me? The book is out right now. Wherever you can buy books, Amazon, all yeah, that good stuff. Amazon, right? yeah, yeah, for sure. Amazon and um, I dropped a book and an album on the same day. So the album is called The Year 2006, and it's basically just paying homage to the Bay Area and everything that we're doing and that we've done. So shout out to anybody that's from the Bay Area that represents. Man, I appreciate all of y'all. E40, Too Short, Filthy Rich, Cookie Money, and everybody else. Man, all black. Uh, Trill Young is all the young dudes that's really making a name for themselves that have made a name for themselves the Bay Area is so vibrant right now and I just love to be from that area so shout out to everybody from the Bay Area hey, that's Kamaya representing of course I little sis Yaya I love her so much she is a superstar um 
And, and, and it's so Kalani, mm-hmm. G Easy. You feel me? G is the new Fonz. Like you know, G is that's the coolest kid on <laughs> earth. That's the Fonz. Like he's the coolest, the coolest dude ever on earth, man. So Pilo, I am Sue, all the heart, everybody, man. So many people in the Bay. Richmond is on fire right now. Um, it's just a beautiful thing, man, to watch what the Bay Area is doing right now. People from everywhere, from Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, Vallejo, San Francisco most definitely. And um, it's just beautiful, man, to watch the whole Bay Area get their just due right now. Everybody's you get all of that working. Shout out the Warriors. I don't People know Fabi is like Spike Lee. <laughs> I'm like Spike Lee at these Warriors games. I, that, that goes well. I'm like the official spokesman for the Warriors. I do the I do like the the narrating on the games and the finals and stuff. Yeah, they, yeah. I don't even think that has to be mentioned. They know where we stand with this Warriors. I've been a Warriors fan since Manute Bowl, Rod Higgins. Like I've been really like you feel me right there. Sleepy Floyd. I've been a real diehard Warrior. So I didn't want to just drive the wave and ride the wave. But I'm a real diehard Warriors fan. Right. Y'all been seeing me at all these finals Absolutely. games. Every I've been there. You feel me? So shout out to my, you know, the greatest team on earth. Can we get a yee? Can we get a yee? <laughs> my man, Mr. Fab. It's the Breakfast Club. <laughs>